Welcome to the Texas Children and Nature Network webinar, Nature and Health Con Recommendations. My name is Sarah Coles, and I am the Executive Director of Texas Children and Nature Network, and we're excited to have you with us today. We are recording the session, so thank you for joining us. To save bandwidth for all our attendees and for a clean recording, we ask everyone to turn off their cameras and mute themselves during the presentation. I will be monitoring the chat, so you can share your questions there, and I'll share them with our presenter. Please remember to keep your comments in the chat kind. Melissa Mullins and Alfred Molina are running tech for us today. Thank you so much, Melissa and Alfred. We, as I said, we're recording. Alice will share the, the recording in a follow-up email. If you're uncomfortable with your name showing, you can change your name to anonymous and then private message Alfred or Melissa with your name for our attendance. Also, if your Zoom name doesn't match the name you're registered with, please change your name or let Alfred or Melissa know. And you can do that by hovering over your name and you'll see three little dots pop up. If you need a certificate and we do not have your name, we will not be able to provide a certificate. And just a reminder, if you're needing a certificate, you'll need to follow the directions that were in the email that had the Zoom link. I'm gonna go ahead and do our land acknowledgement. Texas Children and Nature Network is headquartered in Austin. And as such, I'm on the ancestral and unceded land of the Tonkawa, Comanche, and Sana people. Our ongoing colonial presence on indigenous lands compels us to take action now to counteract the effects of colonization. The work we do through the Texas Children and Nature Network is one small step towards that effort. I'm gonna put a few links in the chat in just a minute about land acknowledgements and about those people groups. I'd like to go ahead and welcome our speaker today, Dr. Aaron Largo-White with the University of North Florida. Thank you so much, Erin, and I'm gonna let you take it away. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about some of my research in my lab at the University of North Florida. My lab is called the Nature and Health Laboratory. Okay, so first, a little bit about me. I understand that there are several teachers in the audience today, and that is awesome. Um, that's actually where I got my roots. So I want to talk a little bit about where I came from, how I came to this work. And I think it kind of helps put things in context. So my background is in education. I started my career in fourth grade classroom. I quickly learned that my passion was in health and public health. And I went on for my master's in health promotion and then went on for my PhD in health behavior with a focus in psychology and environmental education and communication. And those two things were really kind of combined into sort of like an environmental psychology um, focus. So my background comes from education. And then when I reached public health, it really was the social and behavioral aspects of public health. Um, before all that, I have a picture of where I'm from. I'm a Florida native. I'm from the West Coast. I'm from the coast that's called the Nature Coast, um, Inverness, Florida, if anyone's heard of it. It's Crystal River, where the manatees are and where all the hurricanes have been going. Everything's okay. Um, but definitely a challenge. But my childhood, I had these rich experiences. All of these photos here are really from my um, home town, my home county. And um, little did I know were really shaping me as I moved on through my professional career. So all of these things were sort of like separate at this time until I put it all together with some readings and some education that really showed me the importance of nature and health. So here are some of the readings that were important to me and kind of inspired me at key points in my life that pointed me to this area of research, which when I started in 2001, 2002, was really, really new. This area of research was, I was very lonely, to say the least. So it's awesome to see so many people and so many organizations and um, um, so much attention in this area now. It's wonderful. Um, so here are some, some readings. I read The Silent Spring when I was in high school in the early 90s, so I'll date myself. And um, I just pulled a quote from, from this. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure us as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. 
that was uh, that book was really, really moving and kind of inspired me to um, become an environmentalist, truly. Um, later, when I was in public health, I became really interested in kind of the history and roots of public health and was really moved by Florence Nightingale, who is termed the, the founder of modern day nursing. <clears throat> and Florence Nightingale was a scientist and really appreciated the scientific approach. And she really recognized in all of her writings that are still cited today, and these were from the 1860s, um, the importance of nature and healing. And this is just one quote from her, from her book that is still widely quoted in um, clinical public health today. Who has not observed the purifying effect of light and especially direct sunlight upon the air of the room? She has a whole chapter on light and really goes into depth about the importance of, of natural light. Then I was introduced right at the time when I was really starting to step into my social behavioral research to this publication. I encourage everyone to read it if you haven't read it. It's an old one. It's an oldie but a goodie. 2001, Beyond Toxicity, the Human, human Health and the Natural Environment. This is by Dr. Howard Frumkin. Um, and what he did was compile the research that we had available at that time that, that suggested many of which by accident, the connection between nature and health. Um, this was a really important publication to me that basically showed that when we think about environmental health, we think about toxic exposures and chemicals that hurt our health. And he was highlighting some of the findings that suggest there can also be environments that heal us, that are health promoting. Um, so this quote, contact with nature might be an important component of well-being. From an evolutionary perspective, a deep-seated connection with the natural world would be no surprise. And that's always stayed with me. And then in 2008, uh, the book that many of us know, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder um, by Richard Louvre was really important. And right at the time that my dissertation was in full force, time in nature is not leisure time. It's an essential investment in our children's health. And by the way, and also by the way, in our own, I love that little aside. So these are really important foundational things that kind of brought me to um, this work. So what I'm going to do tonight is just share some studies, some studies from back in the days and then some studies from what we're doing in our lab now. But before I do that, I kind of want to frame this in terms of assumptions. These are not quite hypotheses. These are more my assumptions that are based on research on the connection between nature and health. So I have six of them and some of them have little other parts, but um, I hope you'll find them interesting and I hope that they will um, stem some thoughts and ideas in your own practice. So the first assumption I have is the promise of nature. Both passive exposure to nature and active interaction with nature have restorative healing and health promoting outcomes. So we have a lot of research that where we take the side of passive and we have a lot of people who take the side of active. And the point that I'm really trying to bring up is there's lots of data so to support both. So we kind of understand active digging in the dirt and hiking and climbing and things like that. But passive exposures are sometimes a little harder to, um, to wrap our brains around, I think. So I just listed some, ex uh, some examples of passive ex exposures. So this is just a view from a window, taking a break outdoors, outdoor classroom, et cetera. Um, my assumption number two is very busy. There's lots going on here. But basically, this is to say that there, there is theory and mechanism that explains the relationship between nature and health. And it kind of starts on the, on the left over here and moves to the right. So the stress response. We are assuming here that our minds and bodies are connected. So our thoughts, ideas, and, perce and perceptions of our, the world around us impact not only our behavior, but also impact our physiology directly. Um, theory of stress and coping suggests that changing those thoughts, changing that mind-body connection can be something that promotes health and prevents stress. So this is really where you see these arrows coming in. This is really where different mechanisms of how nature is impacting health, where they play in, um, in that perception part of the mind-body connection. So psychoevolutionary theory kind of suggests that nature is a positive focus. It's something that almost distracts us from negative things in a way, if I could use that 
term, whereas attentional restoration theory assumes that nature is restoring resources that we need to cope with stress. So it's um, it's really profound. And really what, what we're suggesting here, the assumption is that psychological stress results in activation in the body. Chronic stress can lead to bad health over time. And nature is one method for reducing stress and enhancing coping to protect health. So it's interesting to me because of how interdisciplinary this is too, biology, psychology, evolution, education, public health, et cetera, all inform this work. Assumption three, ease and convenience is the most important determinant of any lasting lifestyle behavior change. Making nature exposures easy and accessible should be the first priority for practitioners. And in research and in practice, we sort of have kind of camps here too from this health by design and cultivating spaces for people versus the conservation and saving nature um, with the with the idea of making it accessible. So there's two there's two kind of perspectives, and again, they're both important. Measurement assumption four is that nature can be measured. Um, quantity of nature, time, distance, amount, type, quality. All of those things are important for us to advance the field and think about policy and recommendations, which is where we're trying to go. Assumption five, forms and doses of nature. What and how much? This is the, this is the million dollar question. The, my assumption here is that the most direct form outdoor and largest dose time and exposure has the strongest health benefits. Um, we've seen that in studies. We have a need for a lot more research here, but this is the assumption. Here on the right is the nature contact questionnaire that basically shows the different forms of nature that we've studied over time. And we've done a lot of work comparing them, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, also related to this, we don't have enough data yet for specific dose or form type recommendations. We need more research. And it's really, really important. And then also still on forms and dose. This is an interesting question. I always get the question about um, blue nature, green nature, white nature, brown nature. Uh, my assumption here is that the literature surrounding environmental preference which suggests that savanna-like landscapes, which are green, but not too much with access to blue, are preferred by people across culture. So that to me is indicative of maybe a measure of quality. Um, I'm not really sure, but it's something that, it, it's this is a really fun question to think about too. The, the white, brown, too green slash scary nature. I'm kind of from a scary nature area, very rural, wild Florida, lots of predators. So, um, it's an interesting question. Okay, assumption six, Americans spend more than 90% of their time indoors. Children in the US spend less than one hour a day outdoors, even on the weekends. So creating healthy indoor spaces is also a priority. We think about getting people outside, we know that's the best, but we also need to think about these spaces that we're spending all of our time in. Um, healthy indoor spaces bring nature in. And here are some ideas of how we can bring nature in, which I'll talk about some studies. Um, related to that, if we're also thinking about indoor spaces, we want to think about bringing nature in. And we also want to think about in avoiding indoor environmental stressors, things like clutter, noise, and lack of control. Okay. So those are some assumptions. Those are some things that I think are interesting to kind of frame the discussion. And now I wanna do a visual review of some studies. And I'm gonna start with early 80s. Um, a lot of these studies that I'm gonna show or the early on studies happen by accident. And this is one the perfect example. This study found that prisoners with an outside view from their cell of rolling farmland and trees had 24% less vi sick visits over the 11 year period than prisoners with a view of a courtyard in their cell, everything else identical and essentially randomized. So a follow-up study also in the eighties looked at patients in a hospital room with a uh, window view versus those that had a view of a brick wall. So they had the same amount of sunlight, just different views. 
and the impact on their health. So those with the view had a much better health outcomes. Bright natural light, also looking at light without the view. Um, patients with bright, direct, sunny light had significantly shorter average hospital stays than those with dimly lit rooms. Indoor plants has been studied quite a bit. Here's one study, one early study looking at high plant conditions. This is an experimental design versus lower plant conditions. And we see um, increases in perceived well-being, greater perceived attractiveness, comfort, et cetera. Urban trees, greener areas surrounding inner cities uh, correlate to less crime reported. You, this, you see this over and over again. This was a study which they, they termed the um, nature uh, distraction therapy, but essentially what they did was again, in a randomized controlled trial, um, patients in the distraction therapy, the nature group, had a view of a printed nature scene and listened to recorded nature sounds during a procedure versus those who did not have any, had standard care, um, showed 43% increase in self-reported pain control. Um, fish tanks have also been studied. Uh, dental patients, as an example, who viewed fish swimming in an aquarium had significantly lower anxiety and discomfort compared to their counterparts. Dogs and pets, this is a tricky one. Are, are animals nature? I would. I should have, have that as one of my assumptions. I assume that animals are nature. Pet owners, um, especially dog owners, had significantly higher survival rates one year following a heart attack, even after controlling for confounders, such as exercise, which is huge, socioeconomic status, et cetera. So walking on the beach alone versus walking with your dog. Okay, now I'm gonna to get to, uh, with this little logo here, this is the Nature and Health Laboratory, some of the studies that we did. So that was some of the background research that was really important. And those are just example studies that I really tried to pull from the past to show you kind of um, where this all started. But here uh, I start with our lab's work. So I started my work in this area, looking at office environments. And I was really interested in studying um, desk bound office employees because they were stuck in a room all day, the same room. So we, it was an opportunity for us to really measure that space. So what we did was we developed a tool which is called the Nature Contact Questionnaire which measures nature exposure um, for an average employee. So it, it, it has been it has been modified to be used in different settings, but that is how that is how it's published is for employee for workplace settings. What we found was that the more nature exposures in the office were correlated to less health complaints, less stress, and less time off work. Um, that was not a surprise to us, but what was, oops, I don't have my other thing in here. Um, but what was a surprise is when we started to look at the different types of, of nature. So we were looking in the nature contact questionnaire, we have um, a scale of outdoor exposures, bringing nature in exposures and indirect or abstract representations of nature. And what we found was again, the more direct the nature exposure, the greater the health implications were. Um, so those were things such as taking a break outside, eating your lunch outside, et cetera. Those were the greatest impacts compared to um, having a plant, a nature view, et cetera, which we're bringing nature inside. So what we did after that was we designed an intervention where we said, okay, if taking a, a work break outside seems to be really important, let's do that. Let's test the impact of taking a 10 minute work break outside for six weeks um, every morning versus taking a 10 minute work break inside every morning. So the employees were randomized into one of the two conditions and we found that the employees that took the outdoor work break had significantly more health advantages than those that took the indoor work break. Interestingly, both groups had a significant decrease in stress, um, but those in the outdoor group, the slope was like this. I mean, it was like statistically significantly more than the indoor break. So the lesson is we all need breaks, but if you can take that break outside, that's pretty powerful. That's a booster break, we're calling it. So from here, what I became really interested in the idea of that 10 minute break, just the 10 minute break. Wow, that's really powerful. So I really wanted to push the envelope with the um, forms and doses research to say, okay, 
what's the minimum exposure that we need to actually see some change? So we designed an experimental study using some physiological measures of stress. Um, so we could kind of test that in a really efficient way. So what we did was we had people come into a waiting room type environment and um, we randomized them into one of three conditions. They either were in a silence group, in the nature sound group, listening to nature sounds or listening to classical music. What we found was in those three conditions of listening to either nothing, nature or classical music for 15 minutes, we found that those in the nature group showed statistically significantly decrease in muscle tension, pulse rate, and self-reported stress, and did so as early as seven minutes, whereas the other groups saw no change in any of those three outcomes. So that was that was pretty telling, and that seven minutes really um, intrigued me. So then we went on to look at other forms and doses of nature. We've talked a lot about um, light, windows, going outside, um, I was interested in another form that is not widely studied and that is flowers. So what we did here, this was a really interesting study. We had 170 women in um, this study and we told them the study was focused on stress and health. That's it, no nature in there, just stress and health. And it was a 12 day study where we sent them a battery of surveys every day consecutively for 12 days. Um, and we measured stress, health, mood, et cetera daily. What we did is on in the middle of the study on day six, we randomized the women into one of three conditions unknown to them. They didn't know they were in a condition. They either received a thank you flower arrangement delivered to their house. And these are the flower arrangements that were delivered with a note from us that said, thank you so much for being in the study. We really appreciate it. Researchers. Or they were randomized into the candle delivery which is a luxury candle that was prepared, exactly these candles here, um, prepared by the same florist, delivered by the same florist with the same note to those that we randomized in the candle delivery or those that received nothing, but they didn't know that they were in the nothing group. Like I said, they did not. Um, and then we continued the battery of, of surveys the following six days after those deliveries. And what we found was the, the women in the flower condition um, had significantly a significant reduction in their reported daily stress and increases in certain mood measures um, following the flower delivery. That was pretty surprising because we didn't ask them to put the flowers anywhere. We weren't focused on nature. They had no idea we were interested in that. Um, so that was an interesting study. Okay, so now this is focused on children and I would like to just spend a little bit more time talking about a study that we did looking at an outdoor classroom. And this is the last study that I will talk about. And then I'll love to hear some ideas from you all on um, ways that you think you can apply or um, bring this into your own work or your own life. So we did a study several years ago looking at nature at school and we conducted an outdoor classroom study. And th these photos are from that study. So here's an indoor space, and we were comparing it to the outdoor space. Essentially, what we were doing was we had two kindergarten classrooms that were designed that were involved in a six-week study. We had two teachers in both classrooms teaching their respective language arts lesson every morning. They either were in the indoor classroom or they were in the outdoor classroom. There was no difference in the lesson. There was no difference in anything. It was just, are you gonna do it inside or outside today? And then they would switch. And a little bit of history about why we did this study. Um, as I mentioned before, we're spending less time outdoors than ever before. And we know that's a problem. We know that time outdoors is important for healthy development for all of us, but especially for children. Some of the reasons we hypothesize why this is going on, why are kids spending less time outdoors than ever before, um, less than an hour a day on, on weekends, um, is because of overscheduled home lives, technology alternatives. We know screen time is a big factor. And perhaps public health school, uh, public school trends help explain some of this. So the reason that 
outdoor classrooms and nature in general is a really interesting and attractive public health um, solution is because of how practical it is and how, how placid nature is at promoting health. Um, you don't have to commit, you don't have to work hard, you just sit there in nature and do your language arts and you're receiving benefits from that. So it's a really beautiful thing. So we thought that it's practical and we thought that this would maybe fit within public education realities, especially in the state of Florida where we have increased testing um, and pressures related to that. We thought that this would maybe fit in with teacher realities. So doing your lesson just outside, not adding anything additional to your day. So the goal of the study is to build an outdoor classroom and measure the impact on children's health and learning compared to an indoor classroom. Here's some pictures of cuties building, doing, doing some work. So what we did was we didn't have much money. It was a small grant. We really just wanted to see the difference between inside and outside. So we had pilot tested a rudimentary space here and what we we found what worked and what didn't work um, and then adjusted. So things that worked that we highly think that everybody would need just to make it feasible for teachers were things like a convenient shed and storage, cart and ease for transporting the ELA materials, convenient location right next to the school, really lightweight carpet squares that the kids can sit on, um, chalkboards and using nature to define space. What didn't work is it wasn't comfortable. It wasn't defined enough for the kids. They were only in kindergarten. They needed more. And there was no shade. You absolutely have, sh have to shade in the Southeast. Um, so some improvements for space are here based on our pilot. So this is kind of a transition of the space where the one all the way to the left is when it started. It was basically a dirt area. So, um, so what we did was over six weeks, there were 33 days. We had two graduate assistants there every single day measuring the indoor learning and the outdoor learning and the classes, the two classes respectively switched each day. So they served as their own control group. It was really cool crossover design. Some pictures of the data collections in both settings. And what we were measuring in both settings was we're just there passively watching. There were three things that we measured daily. We were measured the number of teacher redirections per day. So the number of times the teachers either said, hey, stop that, or even just a snap. Um, and those were counts, total counts. We also recorded child on task behavior. We had two raters doing that. And we had a count every 15 seconds and measured the number of students on task every 15 seconds. Uh, and then we also measured child well-being with this face survey here. How did you feel? And those were every day. We also had some post-only um, measures. So those happened every day. So 33 times those, those measures happened. Um, the post-only were only at the end of the study. And we looked at the quality of work. We did child interviews with 14 kids and teacher perception surveys. So the findings, in a nutshell, the outdoor classroom had better outcomes. Um, it, even for me who studies this work, I would be at the school and I would watch the children in this setting, sitting there looking at the chalkboard with their notebooks and a motorcycle would zoom by on the road adjacent. And the I would expect the kids to whip around and look and they just did not. Whereas in the classroom, the same teacher, the same kids, they're doing the same type of lesson. And I walk in the classroom and the door creaks when I come in and every single one of them turns their head. So I saw it day in and day out, and it was still amazing to me and um, shocking, honestly. So what we found was the outdoor classroom had statistically significantly fewer teacher redirections. We had fewer children off task in the outdoor condition, and we had mixed results in the well-being. What we found was after about three days, the kids just started drawing crazy faces on, <laughs> on, the, on the survey. So we later found from our child psychologist, don't give them that every day. Don't give them the face survey every day. You give it that you don't, we should have only given it like three times. So that data is not the best, but um, yeah, it was still, we had really strong findings in the behavioral and attention measures and it was really compelling. So here are some more photos. 
So I, I prepared some ideas, but I really do. Um, I know that there are a lot of teachers here and I would really uh, love to hear um, what everyone thinks and ways that they think this should be applied. Because every time I share this with the audience of teachers and others, I always get new ideas and add that to my PowerPoint for next time. So um, here are some ideas. Um, based on our studies and then studies, our study and then studies that have followed uh, since then in 2018. Go outside tips. It really must be feasible, practical, and easy to use from the teacher perspective. Um, and to me and to many teachers that I talk to, that means no, nothing extra, no more layers and work added to the day than you, than you already have, frankly. So if the lessons can be the same, and you're just moving your space and the space is feasible and practical and easy to use, then that may be something that you're able to incorporate into your day. You really need to have school administration support and encouragement. And this is something that is a challenge in many school districts and schools. Um, but this is, I really think that teachers are motivated to do this and we're working kind of our way up. It's sort of like a grassroots interest, at least in, in my area. Um, so the close proximity that's really related to the feasibility. So where you're thinking of bringing the kids, um, if again, the feasible storage of materials being easy. So a shed, a, a shed or a cart or something that makes this easy for the teacher, um, use of nature and existing infrastructure to define the space. You must have shade. Um, and you must be comfortable. And things to consider here are the ground coverage and seating um, are some of the biggest, especially if you're thinking young. If you're if you're with older learners, it may be slightly different. And then some tips on bringing nature inside the classroom. Um, so we know that we're going to be spending some time inside, and we need to we can think about our indoor space for our benefit of our students and our learners and the benefit of our own health and the amount of time that we spend in those spaces. Um, so some ideas is avoid, avoid environmental stressors and bring nature inside. So bringing the nature inside, these are the things that have been studied, what, I, what I'm listing here, but there are possibly other ideas and I kind of have pictures of those other ideas that have not been tested yet, but um, natural light, is important. Not everyone has natural light. Um, I realize that unobstructed view outdoors. So if you do have a window, if you are able to have a view, if that um, works in your classroom, in your school and district, that's really important. So things like moving blinds, having the blinds open, um, moving furniture, artwork, etc. I've seen many elementary schools that you tape up artwork on the windows and it's a really missed opportunity. Um, to have that health exposure. Um, plants, other living things, fish tanks, et cetera, sounds, so recorded nature sounds. Landscape posters have been less studied, but the theory suggests, the assumption going here would suggest that, that um, you'd see some, some impacts of that and other ideas to potentially mimic the outdoors. Um, so here, I think I would maybe stop sharing or minimize or, or allow folks to ask questions. I do have some more slides that I can share based on uh, that focus on future ideas, things that I'm thinking more about that I want to continue working on that I'm happy to share with you all if you're interested. But I wanted to pause here and and um, invite any questions or input. Hi, Erin. Uh-huh. Hi, I'm Jamila Hunter. Thank you so much for a beautiful presentation. Um, I work with the Mayor's Office of Education, Youth Engagement for the City of Houston, and I want to know, um, have you all been able to follow back up with the students that you did your studies on to see um, juvenile detention, like if they were able to stay on the straight and narrow academically, behavior arise, are they encouraged kids, or are they more disengaged? What was the yeah. follow uh, That's interesting. So it was not a longitudinal study by design. Um, the study, it was six weeks long, like I said, but I have a unique, uh, connection with those kids because my daughter was at that school too. 
So mm -hmm. I do know a lot of the children. So that would be something, not all of them, but that would be something I would potentially have access to do some follow-up. Um, so there were two classes of 18 students. And that really, that's a really interesting question, interesting point, something that I think I would like to look into to see if we can do some, um, just some measures of, there, they would be 16, 17 years old now, I um, think in this group. So I think that could be something we could get some interesting data and compare it to a comparison group and, and control for socioeconomic status, parents' education, all that kind of stuff, and see if we see any impact. I appreciate that. This is a brilliant study. Um, I also see most of the children in the pictures, I'm sure due to demographics, uh, there aren't too many children of color. Is that because of the community or because like you said, your daughter was at this school, maybe your neighborhood was yeah. it? Yeah, so this school, so I'll go back. This Some of these photos, like this photo that's on the screen right now, that's my personal photo. So some of them are just personal pictures of kids running around um, in my neighborhood. So that would be reflective of my neighborhood. Okay. But at the school, um, and I'll go back to those pictures. So these are photos from the school. Um, the school is located in, well, it's actually since moved, but it was in Jacksonville Beach. So it was in the beach community. It was a public school, um, but it had a Waldorf focus, which has a, which was open and receptive to the idea of nature and limiting screen time and things like that. So it was a school that was receptive to doing this study. We have tried to replicate this actually in our area um, in, an, in other school in another school and it is it's just harder to gain access to schools honestly in general um and we have not had the grant funding to support that at the other schools it would require a lot more funding i think for the other schools to get on board understandably so yeah um, so this was like i said a small charter school and they were really receptive to it because it was aligned with their philosophy so they were mm -hmm. interested in supporting um it's a little harder to a little harder for us getting into the other schools, but that is something we're actively working on with um, grant funding. So I think my last question would be, ma'am, um, how would you encourage those of us to co-op this concept for like demographics that are um, lower socioeconomic status and also children of color and just not two parent households, et cetera? How could we implement this? Yeah, so I think the really the really amazing thing about nature is that um, it's a, it is passive. It's a passive, healthy exposure. So we don't have to um, ask people to commit. Um, we don't have to ask people to work super hard and to do more than they're already doing. Uh, we just have to give folks the opportunity. So in Jacksonville, Florida right now, we are working on some initiatives with some grant funding to bring nature opportunities to our, our downtown corridor area. Mm -hmm. um, and those are in early, it's, this is very early stages right now, but we're thinking about ways to create opportunities so that there's more nature for kids living there. Um, we see it in Jacksonville, and this is consistent across the country, that real estate costs associated with nature access are higher. We understand the value of nature and we pay for it. We want to live by nature and we understand the value of it intrinsically. So what about places that are not, that are not higher earning places? How can we incorporate nature there? So we're working on some ideas that are, um, that are bringing nature very, very close to people. Because this is something else too that I think the research suggests is that preserving wilderness parks is wonderful and amazing, but you also look at access issues with that. Mm -hmm. So I think having nature super accessible to where kids and where people are is what is critical. And to me, where kids and where people are is they're at the school. The kids are at the school. So if you can work at the school and get into the school, that is huge. Um, and then secondarily, the neighborhood, they're in the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, there have been a lot of efforts here in my area on bringing children out to these beautiful wilderness parks. We have amazing opportunities that would enrich your life so deeply, but from a practical standpoint, it's super hard. It's tricky. So I'm really excited about the emphasis on 
that we call it everyday nature contact, the, mm -hmm. the practical right where you are nature. Um, so I think that that's something that shows great promise um, to reduce those disparities and increase access to nature. I richly appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Jamila, I'll also share um, for <clears throat> kind of what can be done on a more systems change level. Austin ISD has changed all of their education specifications for every school in the district. Mm -hmm. So that every new construction or major renovation project now has to have one of these outdoor classrooms. And so that's a way to make sure that's happening across the board as opposed to um, like on a school by school basis. Oh, awesome. That's Thank wonderful. you so much, Sarah. Yeah, and we have, I think the ed specs for Austin are on our website. If they're not there, let me know and I can get them to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then Erin, we've got a couple questions in the chat from Jessica. We've got, I run my school's Project Acorn and Garden Club. I would love to use grant money to purchase a plant for each teacher at my school to bring that nature element in. But I know that teachers don't want another thing to take care of. So it would have to be mm -hmm. super low maintenance. Do you have any recommendations as far as what would be best? Flowers, vines? cactus, et cetera. Does it matter? I, I don't think it matters. Um, I think I would just try to, like you said, uh, get those, those types of plants that would be the hardiest, that would do the best indoors. Um, and I'm forgetting what the name of that indoor plant is that really does well. It's widely available, starts with a P. Um, actually, I think it's right there. Uh, that happened? <laughs> yes, yes, that one. Um, that would be one. We actually we actually just wrote a grant. We did not get the funding for this grant, um, but I am still. I want to try again for this one. And we we were uh, we created indoor nature nature kits for teachers. And we were, this was focused in Jacksonville in the downtown area. And we were focused at need it, two at need school. One was going to get the indoor kits to start. And all we were doing is giving each teacher a kit, and the kit consisted of a plant. Um, a, a, a um, landscape poster of kind of like the savannah like landscape. We're going to do that. And then nature sounds. I think that was it. I think those were the three things that we wanted in the indoor nature kit. And then the other school is not going to get it. And we we're just going to do a battery of measures over time, looking at if there was an impact. And then at the end, give the second school also the kit. So they all had the advantage of that. Um, so we'll be working on that. I want to, I would really want to see again the lowest hanging fruit, the most practical, simplest solutions are the ones that are the most exciting to me personally. Um, so, yeah. And then we've got a question from Osiris. Is there a study or information about the different effects between nature and artificially created like nature, like the posters, sounds, and artificial sunlight? So in terms of, is the question comparing them, comparing sort of virtual nature to real nature? I think that... so, but Osiris, okay. please feel free to take yourself off mute and confirm. Okay. I, the We have very few studies comparing forms and doses. And the reason for that is just because of study design. So the study that I kind of talked about with the... Um, the first study looking at the office space and impact on health, that's using a tool that measures a bunch of different types of nature exposures. That measures, I think there's 17 different nature exposures it's measuring. So from that type of study where you're measuring all these different exposures, you can compare them to each other based on the impact to whatever outcome you're looking at, whether it's behavior or health but it's a correlational study. So it's just showing you a relationship. So you can say, well, the relationship was stronger when they went outside than when they had an indoor plant. But I don't know if that's really comparing each other. So we know from that perspective that the relationship is stronger in correlational studies between the more direct intense, like the more wilderness it is, the more of a stronger correlation you're getting. Um, but we still do see a relationship between indirect or abstract um, representations of nature as well. 
there was one study that was many years ago, I think the early 2000s, where um, it was at a blood bank and they were looking at stress reactions. I think it was physiological stress reaction, giving blood. And in one condition, they had the nature, it was the old nature sunrise show. I don't even know if they still have that, but it was sort of like before internet was was as hardcore as it is now. So it was sort of like watching those nature scenes and watching it on the TV while you're giving blood versus um, the news. It was daytime news. And they found significant, they found a significant increase in stress reduction with the nature. So there's several studies like that. Um, that I can think of. And then since then, there's been a ton, a ton of growth in virtual reality. People are love virtual reality. So they do all the virtual reality stuff, um, simulations of driving a car in a, in a country lane versus in track, you know, so there's lots of um, work on that. And what we find, find in experimental studies, which we can talk about causation, if you have, if you have pre post and you have a control group, you can say nature caused this reduction. Um, we see it, but it's just hard to compare because we don't usually have all the conditions lined up in an experimental study, if that makes sense. Thanks. Now we have a question from Sonara. Hi, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Your research is incredible. I'm a PhD student from Brazil, and I'm just starting my research on green schoolyards in the global south. Have you come across any research related to this in Latin America? If you have any recommendations, I could follow up by email. I would be very grateful. Mm, that is, um, you know, that is interesting. I really don't know of any research. Um, the the research, the re where the research is really really hot is in Europe. Uh, it, there there's so much work going on in Europe, and I'm constantly being invited to give presentations and to come to Germany or you know. But I really, it's really Western Europe, but you, I really have not seen outside of um, kind of the Western perspective of an interest in nature. And I will tell you up until recently, and I, I mean, in the last 10 years, there really hasn't been much interest in the United States in this area. Um, I had much more collaborative relationships with folks in Europe early on than I did with those in the United States. And it's now we're starting to get a lot of momentum here um, in terms of the scientific community. I think there's always been, you know, the early childhood community and childhood community that's been interested in this, but um, it was more of, of a kind of a parenting circle interest early on. Um, so no, I do not know, but I would love for you to follow up with me definitely um, via email and I can, I have my email on the Ed's last slide or I can put it right in the chat because I can see the chat now. Um, I can just put it right here. Thanks. And I um, also- share... I can offer, oh, is that you, Sarah? Yes. <laughs> this is Sharon. Um, I was going to say that the uh, Cornell Lab, uh, Civic Lab, has a workshop on nature education that is international. Um, and there were many studies presented uh, from uh, South America. If you were asking that question, I would check with the Cornell lab. And then the other resource for early childhood is Natural Start from the National Association for the Education of I don't know, Early Childhood, I don't know. Anyway, um, the so those are resources. But I I uh, have been well since Richard Lou's book came out. Like you, Aaron, it was a inspiration to me. So I began um, training uh, early childhood teachers as a um, at the state conferences and in services that kind of thing. And so I would just limit it since I've done that for so long to two things that are important for an outdoor classroom. And this, um, I would say the storage outdoors is number one on my list because teachers do not have time to gather materials day in and day out and have little helpers carry everything out and carry everything in. Um, you can leave stuff out there um, 
you know, uh, things that you just restock. Anyway, it, it, has, it has to be done for a successful program. And the, the other part, um, I wrote an article in 2010 on the role of the outdoor classroom coordinator. Um, I developed that role at a school that I was at. And it's not just, um, it's administrative. As a matter of fact, fundraising. Uh, mm -hmm. In a couple of years, we raised $36,000 to restore woods. Uh, it's that daily thing of providing the activities of, for and materials for teachers to use, and then upping it each time. You know, like the twos are outside, then the threes, then the fours, that kind of thing. And just changing the materials in accordance with the uh, developmental appropriateness. Mm -hmm. So um, those are two things that I think are primary. But I initially was interested when you spoke about proximity to nature. Um, I'm also an advocate for trails in Houston. And one of our trails was built in my neighborhood thanks to the HOA. So as a master naturalist, I have invited, uh, you know, the Audubon to do bird walks. The flood control gave us wildflowers. Uh, last year and then i'll stop last year i invited one of the hospitals to participate as a public health measure and they have a program called um exercises medicine so they mm -hmm. uh brought salsa dancers out to my event in april mm -hmm. uh, so those are the kinds of things that um i appreciate uh, hearing about and sharing with you Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love the um, the idea about the coordinator. That is in it, having grant funding um, role too. That is really that's that's something new that I've heard. So that's really great. I'm going to add that it to the list. It actually saves money rather than yeah. is a cost. Right. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. Um, Yes, and the exercise is medicine and bringing in the public health perspective, I think. So there's a new, uh, not a new, a new phrase, lifestyle medicine, which includes exercise is medicine and, and food is medicine and nature is medicine and all of these kind of things. But it's to say that nature is part of a healthy lifestyle. So, and prevention matters. So we're, this is part of lifestyle is lifestyle medicine is too prevent problems before they happen. So we're trying to create and facilitate a healthy world, a healthy lifestyle. Um, and I really see that nature fits within that lifestyle medicine view, scope. So. We have a tagline for our trail that's really only three years old and it's uh, where community and nature meet. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, that's great. we're educating. <laughs> There's another term called One Health, which is also sort of it's representing um, it's representing how human health, wildlife health, and environmental yes. health all are one and connected to each other. So supporting one supports the other, supports the other, and it's always sort of this circular image. I've seen different sort of logos and different depictions of of One Health, and I really. I really also identify with One Health, lifestyle medicine, and kind of thinking about um, how, I mean, nature is center on both of those, really. I mean, it is. We get a lot of that information here in Houston because of Jaime Gonzalez, who's with huh? One Health. Yeah. Yes, that's wonderful. Well, and a bunch of people from Houston. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of great stuff going on in Texas. Wonderful. So I think I have I have a few more slides and I think I will just um if it's okay, Sarah, just share. These are just some things that are that I'm thinking about going forward, um, just in the last few minutes. And then uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, okay. Okay. 
Um, Sorry, I was. I realized I was asking you a question while I was muted. So you, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I didn't wait on the for enough silence. I think I rushed on. Um, so these are just some quickly some things that I'm still working on, and I mentioned some of the things the nature kit study, um, some other studies we're trying to do in downtown Jacksonville. Oops, I didn't even talk about this. Um, but one really important thing is measurement, defining what nature is, thinking about um, what is quality, forms and doses, et cetera. And that's um, more work expanding. So priority populations, inclusions, we talked about this, we talked about access um, and disparities, uh, environmental justice, this really has implications for a lot. So we need to make sure we're, we're working and helping in, with those kids and folks that really need us the most. Uh, I'm also really interested in the idea of nature prescription. We do need a lot of information in order to get there related to, like I said, forms and doses and knowing those minimum standards and really how the different types of nature compare to each other. But um, we have an organization here in Jacksonville, Tim Timaquan Parks Foundation. We have the largest park system in the US in Jacksonville, Florida. It's the largest geographically. We have, I don't, I can't even tell you how many beautiful uh, wilderness parks I Google, I don't even want to say because I'm sure I'll be wrong. Um, but we have lots of opportunity to do this. And we have a huge healthcare system in Jacksonville, Florida with Mayo Clinic, Baptist Health, um, et cetera. There's lots of them here. And then really kids, this is really an area, this is where I want to focus. It's really important. Children are a priority nature deficit disorder, I think they have great, they have probably the largest impact effect of nature. Um, and I think the screen time is something that is very much related here to these things go hand in hand. I haven't studied that as much as a parent. I've seen it. I have three kids, um, ages now 12, 14, and 17. So I've seen a lot of screen time stuff. And I can say anecdotally, it's really important. And the research is starting to suggest that too. Um, and more outdoor classroom and school related. Again, where are kids? There they are at school. So that's that's where I'm really interested in moving forward. And I would love to get the, the last question. I'm sorry, I didn't pause long enough to hear that. No, I think this one was actually a comment related to the the teacher who asked about um, bringing plants in for teachers. And mm -hmm. Kathleen said, maybe we can invite the children to bring a plant in. They may bring a cutting from a plant they find, then learn about it, at, about the botany and grow the plant in the class garden. Then they will try to protect the plants more because it's there and they get more joy from noticing it growing. That's awesome. Yeah. That's bringing in a lot of times we do see nature, nature and children, we see a lot of environmental and science education, and it's just sort of a natural fit. Well, thank you so much, Erin. Mm -hmm. uh, a few uh, last few announcements. We did put in a link to our evaluation, and we've been talking about forms of evaluation all night, so we all know that evaluation is important. So if you could help us by filling that out, that'd be great. Our next webinar is on November 6th, and it's delve into the LEAP program, which is our Library Explorer Adventure Pack program. So it's a program that we've got going on with libraries where folks can check out backpacks with outdoor gear in it. Mm -hmm. And our health and nature liaison, Marisa Oliva, is going to be doing that presentation. And then lastly, our summit registration is open. So if you haven't already registered for our summit, it's December 11th through 13th in Waco, Texas. So we would love to see all of you there. Um, and again, Erin, thank you so much for presenting tonight. We really appreciate it. It's been a great presentation. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. And everyone have a fantastic night. Thank you.